This is Inside the Tour in association with Vodafone, lead partner of the British and Irish Lions. I'm Alistair Eakin, Lions fanatic and rugby commentator. I plan to stay connected to this summer's tour with the official Lions app, powered by Vodafone. This is episode three of our 10-part romp through the Lions Tour of South Africa in 1997. We've got another familiar voice to meet at the start of this episode, so let's bring it on. The full story of the 97 Lions in South Africa. Inside the Tour. There's a difference for playing for the Lions and winning with the Lions. But that's a kind of horrible thing to have in your head. It's a great thing if you can balance it properly, but it's horrible too. It was like a clash of stags. That's what it was like. They were, jeez, they were huge. I'm Keith Wood. I was the Lions hooker in 1997. You don't want to let the guys down. You know, that's, that's a big thing. So welcome, Woody, the latest Lions legend to join our cast list for this 10-part series. You can get involved at Inside Tour Pod on social media and stand by for some pretty heavy stories of pain and punishment as the Lions hit the training ground. Every training session was incredible and you end up maxing out as forwards on that trip. There was afternoons where you're just sleeping for the whole afternoon to try and get over training sessions. It was pretty relentless. The physicality that we went through, and particularly the forwards went through, will never ever be repeated. It was brutal. It really was brutal. Well, I can remember the first training session that we had. It was about two hours, two hours, 20 minutes. And I can remember the sense of, I don't know whether it's disgust or um, disbelief, for the fact that we were training for two hours, 20 minutes, and the back seemed to be having a conversation, and we were already killing ourselves. We went straight into the idea of we need to be tougher, stronger, fitter, faster sort of thing. I'm Matt Dawson, and I played scrum half on the Lions Tour in 1997. Unfortunately, it, it, was, it was part of that era of professional sport, professional rugby, when if you were an international side, you probably would meet on a Tuesday or Wednesday... If you're a club side, you train on a Tuesday and Thursday night. Oh, it's professional, right. Well, we, you can do all of those. You can do everything every day, all day. And that's what we did. You know, if you did a training session, you, you could feasibly do contact three, four days on the spin. And, yeah, I mean, it, it absolutely took its toll. But, it, but we needed to be technically and tactically better than them. We were never going to be physically better than them. I think a lot of that actually came from the players themselves. James Robson, team doctor. We had the um, likes of Tatey and John Bentley coming in, having been in, in rugby league, and I think they brought an enormous element of a, a different training ethos in those days. And I could see them actually showing some of the guys how to do certain things in the gym that perhaps they weren't used to and were of value. I don't think many of the rugby union boys had, had, had trained with such intensity. All right, the forwards will have done when they've been doing the scrummaging practice and, and what have you, but, you know, the, the, the stands we set for training, I remember barking at when I was inciting somebody to hit the shield that I was holding and one of the players said, Ben, just calm down, we're only training. And I snapped, I said, that's how we should train. You know, that's the way that we should be training. I think in 1997, it was largely a case of, of expecting big collisions. In this country, I'd regarded the specimens that I saw before me were some of the biggest guys that I'd worked with. And all of a sudden, we're faced with even bigger guys. It was simply big men playing bigger men. I think everybody's trying to put down a marker. I mean, lines are quite extraordinary. If you if you think for any ordinary listener of what it's like playing any team and turning up to play the team as a 10 or 12 year old or 15 year old or whatever age you are, and all you want to do is impress the other people that are there. You know, you want to put your hand up and say, I'm, I'm pretty good at my, at my sport and I'm able to play. You go and bring that to a Lions view and you recognise everybody there. You um, uh, have some level of looking up to a huge number of them. You don't know some of them particularly well, 
but you're trying to impress very quickly. And it's trying to get your head around impressing as an individual within a team context. And that's incredibly interesting. That's what makes the lines that intriguing thing that we get every four years is how do you lay all your cards on the table um, for you to work as a team? Our sole target was to get parity. It wasn't to destroy them. It wasn't to try to bowl them over. It, it was as if we were accepting that they were going to be more powerful and better than us in the scrummage. What can we do to get parity? If we can get parity and we can get the ball in play, then we have got a game plan and the superstar players that can win us the game. We've got the brains. This is Rob Wainwright here and we are inside the tour with the Lions in South Africa in 1997. I think David McLean was, was the timekeeper. He was the man that would muzzle Jim Telfer <laughs> when the time came. And it was, it was interesting to see Jim meekly ending a session, maybe when he was in full flow because he'd hit the time. So it had obviously been organised, but I, you know, I don't know who by or, or when, but it, it was so important because you need that intensity, but you don't need two hours of it. So Jim was undoubtedly the cornerstone of getting our pack particularly to give enough ball. We had great backs, but we needed to compete up front and he put the backbone into into the pack, undoubtedly. I'd have killed Jim if the tour went on for another week. I, there was only so much I could take of him. And, and I say that with proper affection. I thought technically as a coach, he was fantastic. I mean, really fantastic. But I thought as a man manager, he was he was excellent. He'd he'd pull at a thread so that you figured out exactly whether this was right, wrong, or indifferent, you know. And he you challenge your own assumptions because of what he wanted and how he talked about it. We did this one session and we did forty scrums and we held them for thirty seconds. And then he would say sprint and touch the wall and come back and do another scrum. So the, I don't know, it was whatever. 20 yards away we ran and got back and got ready to hit the next scrum um, he did say at one stage run as fast as you can and then accelerate um, I'm not going to do a Scottish accent with him so I mean some of his uh, some of his chat in those sessions was legend but um, I like we did 46 scrums in 40 minutes and it was ludicrous you know and brilliant and, you know, we had it. It was, that was us. You know, that was the, uh, I can't say it was the making of it, but we knew we put an awful lot of money in the bank for those. There was a lot of sweat, a lot of energy, a lot of pain went into that bank. I mean, the scrum halves would spend hours with the forward pack, not doing anywhere near as much work as they would. We'd be just, you know, encouraging verbally where, I, where they're getting flogged to death. But all we'd be working on would be the the hook, the strike to the number eight's feet and away. That is, that was an absolute priority for the scrum halves to the point where you would, you know, you'd spend hours and hours and hours where people like Keith Wood, Mark Regan, they would just lean against the scrummage machine in the hooking position. Rodders would be squatting or that Eric Miller and that would be squatted as the number eight. So the three of you would just, you know, work on tap ball in, hook, number eight pick up, tap ball in. And I mean, God knows how many thousands of times we did that. We ended up having a couple of really heavy sessions um, where, uh, where we'd scrummage against each other, which was tough. A lot of those ended in some element of a scrap um, because we're all vying, you know, and it's tough. And then we had a good few on the machine, that accursed machine that I despised. And, um, and I didn't mind scrummaging machines. I just didn't like that one. It had hydraulics on it. It was brutal. Oh, ridiculous. It really was brutal. Absolutely ridiculous, wasn't it? I mean, it's bloody hard. It just seems insane. So dangerous. Well, we... Uh, uh... Unlike previous lines, we took all our own equipment. 
Fran Cotton. I was the manager of the 1997 British and Irish Lions. Because we knew the uh, inconveniences that were put in your way when you went on tours to South Africa, where you'd pitch up at the training ground, but the shed was locked where the scrum machine was supposed to be. You couldn't get it, so we took everything. We took a whole lot. And uh, Nigel, I think it was Rhino, I'm not sure the make of the scrum machine, but... uh, Nigel Horton, the England uh, second row and British Lion, was uh, uh, their representative, uh, really taking the scrum machine all around the uh, all around South Africa. Uh, I don't think Matt got anywhere near the scrum machine, by the way. So I, w- I don't think he'd understand any of the pain. But he had this this hydraulic system that you could increase the pressure coming back on you, and you could always tell, uh, also tell what force was coming through from the uh, the scrum. So it, it was a pretty uh, yeah, pretty brutal bit of kit if you were uh, in the scrum. That's for sure. The scrummaging sessions we had the brute session that we had that was um we'd we'd hit the scrum hold the scrum for 30 seconds 30 seconds seems like a short period of time i can i can guarantee you it's not and and when you're when you're thinking about this scrums then were you'd crouch you 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 wouldn't even have got the chance to crouch so you're going from a point where you're hitting them i mean it's far safer now Uh, there's huge pressure now as well but at that stage, we were charging from a metre and a half. It was like a clash of stags. That's what it was like. And um, so you're, 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 you're jockeying for position. Um, you're trying to get into the strongest position you can get into. And, and we had set this machine really low. So we were hitting the machine and hitting the ground because we weren't able to do it with enough control. Like That was a huge adjustment trying to figure that. Because I tell you what, if you have... Uh, eight guys and you're hitting a scrummage machine and you miss the pads you're skidding into metal in underneath it you know it's there's and I'm the one stuck with my arms you know holding onto somebody else I there's nothing I can do all I can block it with is my head the scrummaging session against this horrific scrummaging machine which had hydraulics that would push I mean god knows what that was doing to the players I mean it just seems insane no, Scrum Half's job is to look after his forwards, right? So he's 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 following protocol. Um, um, it had a hydraulic machine, and I, they said they I don't know whether they did or not, but they said they put two and a half tons of pressure, you know, on the hydraulics across our necks, which is great fun um, when you think about it, and. It, it was a puke-inducing machine. It just was. It was just. It doesn't matter how hard a scrummaging in a game is. There's give and take because this guy loses his bind or loses his foot or everybody there's an adjustment. Uh, there's an adjustment in everything. And there's no adjustment in hydraulics. You're, I mean, you're trusting somebody to take a little bit of pressure off, but there's there's no human real adjustment in it. And... You're, you're hitting the scrum and you're holding the scrum for a period of time and it's it's horrible. I mean, there's no joy in that. I don't, if anybody says there was joy in that, there's, they're lying. They have to be lying or else they're total masochists because it was, I, I it's just a rotten machine. And the story continues after this message from Vodafone's Lions ambassador. Hi, it's Sam Warburton here, captain on the last two Lions tours. Ahead of this year's trip to South Africa, look out for Lions Live, created by Vodafone, bringing you closer to the Lions. We'll have pre-match analysis and discussion, plus exclusive Vodafone Lions content and guests from inside the camp. For more information, make sure you download the official British and Irish Lions app, powered by Vodafone. Hope you can join us for Lions Live. Scrum. Two groups of eight interlocking. The rugby restart. The ball to be won, ground to be gained. Crouch, bind, set. 
Victory at the Scrum, a psychological conquest, a tactical masterstroke. Scrummaging is something entirely different. The Scrum. The Scrum. Rugby's brutal battleground. I mean, it's bloody hard. Later in this series, as we arrive in Cape Town for the first test, we'll analyse the mechanics of that lion scrum, how the punishing training ultimately helped break the Springboks, a strategy which has gone down in rugby legend, with Matt Dawson and Keith Wood front and centre. It's about body position for general play, it's about running lines, support lines, it's about... Um, uh, vocalizing where you are you know um, it's trying to understand the nuance of all the other players and the more training you do for guys that you're not used to playing with um, the better you get to understand them so all that happens scrummaging is something entirely different but there was one guiding principle was that we couldn't really um, outboss guys that were huge so even didn't matter if we had the biggest pack that we had out there, we had some pretty big guys. Um, were we going to be good enough to compete with them at their weight, at their height? Um, so it was always an element about getting a little bit lower. And that became one of the sort of guiding tenets of every scrummaging session. Uh, can you hold the weight? Can you hold the weight really, really low? Can you not collapse under that weight? And um, let's use their weight against them. Will they be able to hold themselves up if we go really low? And and I, ultimately, I think that led then towards selection. We we had very very clever coaches that would analyse everything that South Africa were doing, would highlight the, um, the the weaknesses, and you know we would absolutely focus on them those parts that would give us the advantage up front. You know, Paul Wallace could manipulate himself into a position where it didn't matter how strong it, it, you, know, you you could have put Jeff Capes it, it doesn't it didn't matter who he was scrummaging against they wouldn't they, it was impossible to move him from the position that he was in but the South Africans couldn't handle it they couldn't handle the height particularly that Paul Wallace was scrummaging at I, I thought Paul Wallace was, he was very raw. And even though we were the same age, um, he was raw at international rugby and he was very strong and hadn't got his technique down pat. And Jason Leonard took him under his wing and in many respects, losing the starting berth because of it. So, like Leonard was a hero on, on our tour because we he personified everything that we were talking about you know that he embodied this the 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 spirit of leaving it all on the table and but Wally soaked it up like a sponge and performed phenomenally under huge pressure for Tom Smith for Tom Smith it was kind of different I like Tom never said anything to anybody you know I mean he's like a silent assassin so you never really discussed about whether Tom was was there but for me now, I have to say he was just as as a Lou said, I look, I toured with him on, on two lines tours and it of course never played with him in the interim and it was like getting into an old leather armchair. You know, he just was so comfortable. It just he he didn't kind of care what you were doing. He didn't his his job was to do his job. He just didn't I it's whether he doesn't speak and that was part of it or whatever, but I ended up Say, my God, this guy will. If I say I'm sorry, I'm leaving you now to help the tight head, or if I'm dropping my shoulder, he, he didn't seem to. He did. He didn't care. He just did what whatever was happening. He did whatever was happening. Having Tom Smith and Wally and Woody up front in that three ball w was so enormous in the whole context of things. Everybody thinks about the front row and when they talk about scrummaging and we're the squat guys at the front and they think that that's the necessity of it. If the second rows aren't doing a job, if the back rows aren't doing a job and you know that they have many jobs to do, we have one job to do 
And uh, because once the scrum is over, it's over, we get up and go and do something else. When the scrum is over for them, they've to make certain their defensive alignment is perfect. They have a whole variety of things they have to do. We have to walk for three or four yards first before we think of doing anything. So it requires all eight to do the job and to do the job um, as well as they can. So, and I, I imagine there must have been uh, an adjustment for back rows and second rows for what they do scrumming that low. It was actually hard for me, I, I will admit. So I was, um, you know, I'm six feet tall. And at that stage, that would have been very tall for, for a hooker. There's difficulty the taller you are as a hooker to have the flexibility when people are pressing down on the back of your neck and shoulders. It's it's what we would always do against somebody who is taller than you. Put a pressure on the back of his head, put your legs further back and see if he can lift his leg, you know, to strike the ball. It's it's That's the difficulty. So that's where you feel quite vulnerable as a, as a hooker. So I would have found elements of that quite hard. Um, um, you get over that pretty quickly, though. It was so different I mean and you would do it of course you do it with Ireland or with clubs or whatever you were playing with you'd go low for, at different times but this was consistently low all the time and it's it's a hard a hard pressure actually pressure Jenkins goal kicking tension Neil Jenkins that day I mean precision Jenks just like a machine just stepped up accuracy I've never seen anybody stroke the ball the way he stroked it. Coolness. Coolness. Tension. 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 Pressure. 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 I thought he didn't miss one kick on tour. He didn't miss one kick on tour. Yeah, I I think it's not about the pressure, is it? I think if I certainly felt the pressure, I probably probably wouldn't have been there, really. I'd have been in the wrong place. Hi, I'm Neil Jenkins, starting fullback for the British and Irish Lions against South Africa in 1997. When you're there, and you, I was very lucky. I had Dave, I was working with Dave as well. Dave Aldred, who was, you know, he's exceptional. Dave, he's 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 the best out there Even today. There's no doubt in that. He's incredible what he does, and um, and you know, as the first time I'd come across, really, I had a little bit of time when I was with Adidas, uh, but uh, but obviously being Welsh, Dave being English. He's working with the English guys. He's not so much working with us, you know. So um, it's the first time probably a really, you know, I did, as I said, a little bit of uh, with Dave prior to that, but not a great deal. But, you know, working with him on that tour, working incredibly hard from, from day one. Um, I, I always use sand um, leading up to that tour. And I went with Dave and I used the kicking tee for the first time. And uh, I felt, you know, when I was looking at the amount of work that we were doing, it's probably more. It was easier for me to use a tee and to change the way I was doing things a little bit, because um, the amount of work we were actually doing, I didn't really want to be carrying my sand bucket around with me left, right, and centre, and all around South Africa. So uh, I think that would, I think that would have worn me out if I'm honest. Uh, but yeah, no, we used to we used to work incredibly hard with Dave, and um, I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, he's a good guy, you know, for me. I really get on with Dave. And um, I really enjoyed the time that we spent together on that too. It was incredible, really. But the amount of work that we put in from day one up until the end was was incredible. And uh, I think that put me in good stead for when the pressure moments come in, in these test matches. That You know you know full well as a kicker, the amount of work you do leading up to a game is, is, is as important as what you do in the game. It's not more important and uh, it puts you in a good frame of mind. But it's, it's, it's your job. It's what you do. You prepare week in, week out to do that, really. And it's... I, I, I feel is expected of us really and that's why we do it Neil and I had, had, had had the privilege of playing rugby I'm Scott Gibbs together for different districts so up against each other and playing with each other for each other uh, on the same team since we were probably eight years of age his talents and application and dedication to the game were familiar to me that there is no doubt um, to to ask a player of his magnitude to play out of position in such a dislocation from 10 to 15 is, is was you know is, was enormous look I'm, I'm not a full back full stop I'm not going to lie I played in the Five Nations for Wales um, RL was playing at 10 and Kevin Bowen always said to me he always felt that he wanted our best players playing so it was probably me moving position um, which you know again look RL is a, a talented rugby player very good rugby player but I wasn't overly keen on that if I'm honest with you um, playing for Wales and playing for the Lions is two separate things I can assure you um, we were, weren't great defensively for Wales but the Lions were incredibly defensively so it probably helped me out no end 
Um, you know, I'm not the quickest. I know I'm not the slowest, but playing a full back, you need some wheels as well. Like, but I suppose what helped me was is that red that red wall that was in front of me, really, and the defence was incredible. So, you know, I'm not not about worried or nervous or stuff like that. But you know, it's just you know, it's it's another test match on it and a, and a huge one. And you know, I've been used to some of them with Wales. We played some big games for Wales, but yeah, once once we were picked and I was involved, I was really looking forward to it, to be honest. And uh, I knew there wouldn't be an awful lot coming through my channel, so that, that that was a saving grace in that regard as well. I thought he didn't miss one kick on tour. He missed plenty, but I actually, I felt I jogged back to the halfway every time he had a kick. Um, just presumed that was the case for him, because I just, I've never seen anybody stroke the ball the way he stroked it. I mean, the most uncomfortable man at 15 of all time and the most essential man to, to kick a ball of all time. I'd be pretty simplistic for me. It was literally just my, my run up was key for me. I'd always, you know, I'd have four steps back, two and a bit to the side. Um, I always needed to be in that right position where I felt, um, you know, I was I was in control of what I was doing really, um, and that, that's that's it would be as simple as that really. I always I didn't like to get too quick. I'd always control my run up, and it was my follow through was probably the most important thing for me really. Um, it, it, it wouldn't. It was never that complicated. It never is that complicated. Um, as I said, the most important thing for me was was the practice I did in the week. If I never did the practice, I always felt a little bit vulnerable. If I'm honest with you, um, I was one of them people that would like to put myself through the through the mill in the week, work hard, and then I, I more often than not would be in a very good place come the Saturday, and um, and that's why I enjoyed the tour with Dave and stuff, and the amount of work that we did in the week. One of the key elements before we, we departed, I remember vividly Keats telling us is, it's not what we do on the training field is gonna win us the, the test series. And what he meant by that was, there's a lot of guys in this tour that have played 40 plus games. So trying to flog them during this eight week period, we're not gonna get the best out of them. So, you know, it was a clear focus on preparing well, showing up, being on time, and making sure that we can keep that intensity there for 45 minutes to an hour and no more. I thought that was great because it, it really f sharpens the mind when you go into a practice. It happens sometimes that you need to put extra sessions, but I think that was clearly in the back of his mind that he wanted to keep everybody fresh. If the quality, the intensity and the, the skill set is there, then we could just continue to build that through that morning session and then there wouldn't be any more practice for the rest of the day. I think the training was very, very well focused. I mean, uh, Ian and uh, Jim were the perfect combination. I think the really brutal sessions were uh, when we'd lost our first game against uh, Northern Transvaal, the Blue Bulls. We hadn't really performed that well in the scrum. We'd had a difficult afternoon against Western Province. Jim put them through the most brutal scrummaging session I've ever seen. You know, they absolutely crawled off the pitch at the end of it. But there weren't too many of those sessions. I mean, there weren't long three-hour sessions. They were pretty highly focused and uh, and sharp. So I don't think we overtrained at all. I think, you know, the kind of management of the training load in preparation for the game was just about right. I mean, from my own personal mindset, you know, I wanted to get into or oh, stay in great shape. I'm someone who enjoys practice, you know, like perfect practice makes perfect. And also uh, as a centre, I'm being surrounded by phenomenal talent in that position as well with Will Greenwood and Alan Bateman and, and, and Jerry, etc. You know, there was a lot of competition, but also a lot of appreciation for everybody's skill sets. So that, that brought the best out of all of us. You know, I'd been injured. Um, I, I was a little bit unsure. Obviously, the training in Weybridge leading up to us going that that was a uh, that was an important part for me to get through that and to prove my my fitness. You were desperate to get on that pitch. You were desperate to get that Lions under your name, really. And um, obviously, you know, just being on the plane. But again, this being on the plane is great getting here, but you want to play. And that's where we'll rejoin this story in episode four of the series. How does a squad of 30 plus get whittled down to a team of 15? And how does the midweek side, so crucial to a Lions tour, stay on form, on message, on side? The midweek side 
was essential. It, and the midweek side is pretty much essential on every Lions tour. So we've done all the call-ups, the bonding and the training. We basically tried to become a team in that week at Weybridge. We only touched the ball twice, we only trained twice with the ball and we kicked the living daylights out of each other, which stood us in great stead for the tour ahead. Now it's time to finally leave for the tour of a lifetime. Yeah, Virgin Atlantic, upper class, thanks for coming. So you can share your memories of that summer of the Lions in 1997. The excitement amongst the players was shared by all the fans. You can get in touch with us at Inside Tour Pod. It was a completely new Lions experience. Oh, it was, it was madness. It was utter madness. Inside the Tour is a 94-19 production for Audi. Alex Corbusera here, former British and Irish Lions rugby player and proud ASM Scholarships ambassador, telling you all to check out ASM Scholarships. At ASM, we connect rugby athletes with universities in America that provide sports scholarships. Apply today at asmscholarships.com for your free assessment to see what universities you qualify to.